Welcome to you, welcome to our audience, and of course, a warm word of welcome to our guest of honor, Jill Lavore, and to our moderator this evening, Kenneth Manusama. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, and this is... Christard Gralenbeets. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Commission in the Netherlands. I would like to extend a warm welcome also to the Fulbrighters here present and to everybody who got to know about this event via our Fulbright network. Um, as you may know, uh, Fulbright is about promoting um, mutual understanding between citizens of the United States and citizens of other countries, in our case, citizens of the Netherlands. We do that through uh, exchange of students in uh, higher education, but also by um, working together with the John Adams Institute we like to have one lecture every year that we co-sponsor, and we are thrilled that we have the lecture uh, today with Professor Lepore. And what we found out is the last time we had this um, cooperation together was also with a lecture by Professor Lepore. So maybe a nice suggestion would be, Professor Lepore, that you write every three and a half years uh, a book and come here and tell about it. Have a nice evening. But she's very productive, so I'm sure that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and we discovered that we both also have a Harvard connection. That's true. <laughs> what did you do at Harvard? 20 years ago, I got a Fulbright scholarship and went to Harvard to the Kennedy School of Government to do a Master of Public Administration. And actually, next month, I'll go to Harvard for a reunion. So, thrilled to have a Harvard <laughs> professor here already come uh, have the experience here. Yeah, yeah. And I was a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design of 2007, so it's a Harvardian evening, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we are delighted that the Dutch publishing house, the Arbeiderspers, has chosen to translate Jill Lepore's book, New York Burning, of 2005, now in 2023. And I believe the reason that they decided to do this was the celebration of the abolition 150 years ago of slavery in the Netherlands in the Dutch colonies, or actually 160 years ago, depending on how you look at it. And we will hear more about the uh, history of this event this evening from Jill and also in conversation with Kenneth Monusama. I wanted to inform you, as you can see, there's also a film being made this evening. This is a pilot of a new project by filmmaker Kelly Nikes, with whom we've worked before. He made a wonderful film about Noam Chomsky, to which we dedicated an event several years ago. And he's now working on a new series called Insights, based on speakers at the John Adams. So if we're all on our best behavior and the conversation is really titillating, this might turn into a whole series. Kelly, I hope so. We'll do everything we can to make it possible. Our moderator this evening, it's his first time with us and we're delighted to have him. He teaches constitutional law at the Amsterdam University College and he also makes a podcast called Amerikaanse Toestanden. And so over dinner we explained to Jill how to interpret <laughs> the word Toestanden. <laughs> uh, and I think she got it and I think she, is very well situated to know how, what everything that happens in the US, what kind of waves and ripples that creates here in the Netherlands. And there are a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kenneth's introduction will be uh, on our site later so you can read it again at your leisure. And for now, uh, I'll come back at the end to do some closing remarks. And for now, I would like to thank you for joining us and give the floor to Kenneth for his introduction. Thank you, uh, Tracy. Thank you, Chris Fulbright. Um, thank you all for uh, being here, of course. And of course, thank you, Jill, for, for being here again, as was commemorated. Um, no Harvard connection for me, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, but Jill Lepore is the David Woods Kemper Professor of American History at Harvard University, a staff writer um, at The New Yorker, also a podcaster, and a, what I consider to be a true public intellectual. She has authored 14 books, including one novel, right, um, and won numerous awards for them over the years. I won't mention all the books and all the awards because I have only a couple minutes, um, but you know Jill Lepore. Um, and that's why, because that's why you're here. You're probably here because you know her for her 
fusion of rigorous academic research with an unparalleled uh, narrative style. Historical storytelling with a mountain of historical evidence um, at its finest. You're also probably here because Tia Lepore has succeeded in telling untold stories from American history. I would consider her one of the symbols of contemporary historical writing that kind of demystifies American history uh, to further the reckoning that America so desperately needs, seeing that as an outsider. Um, and as I said, she does this not only through books, but also through her tremendous production for the New Yorker magazine, in which she tackles the same, um, in the same beautiful literary style, it's the New Yorker, uh, many, many different topics with a historical perspective. Um, recently covering, for instance, seed catalogs, um, and deeply personal and beautiful pieces. But I'm honored to speak with Jill uh, in a few minutes about one of her earlier books, New York Burning, Liberty, Slavery, and Conspiracy in 18th Century Manhattan, a finalist for the coveted Pulitzer Prize as well. Um, and also, as was me uh, mentioned, the Dutch translation by the Arbeiters Paris Publishing House that we kind of celebrate today is important as we in the Netherlands are only now in the midst of reckoning uh, of our own history with slavery and our big role in the slave trade. The book about the fallout of a series of fires within a few weeks that raged in Manhattan in 1741 paints a picture in graphic detail and in graphic original language of the reality of the enslaved and in the mindset of the, uh, sorry, in the, mindset of the enslavers in New York and its relation to party politics in pre-revolutionary America. But while I desperately love New York, I never did discuss the fact, the obvious fact, that it was the Dutch who introduced also enslaved Africans in what would become New York, while the evidence in the form of persistent inequality was all around me. John Adams, who never owned enslaved people, abhorred slavery. James Madison, slaveholder, founding father and fourth president of the United States could, like most founding fathers, already see the problems induced by the in institution of slavery, but couldn't do anything about it. All these perplexities, Madison wrote to the Marquis de Lafayette in 1820, all these perplexities develop more and more the dreadful fruitfulness of the original sin of the African trade. Slavery is considered America's original sin, and Dutch traders and settlers had a significant role in it. I quoted earlier the full title of the book, New York Burning, Liberty, Slavery, and Conspiracy in 18th Century Manhattan. And these two other concepts, conspiracy and liberty, denote, at least for me, the effect of slavery on New York and the country. In some way, the book reads like a multi-episode, multi-season, law and order-like television show with twists and turns, different suspects, and conspiratorial paranoia all around. I'll ask Professor Lepore later, perhaps, whether she believes that she cracked the case. Um, what the story in this book means or illustrates for liberty or the self-perception of liberty in America, I can perhaps leave to um, Professor Lepore in a minute in our conversation. Because I am a lawyer, not a historian, although sometimes I wish I was. And I guess that, at least to, according to the U.S. Supreme Court these days, I also need to be a historian, as the court has put a premium on historical tradition and analysis in constitutional interpretation. However, I wish they would leave historical research and analysis to people like Jill Lepore. So, in that spirit, uh, and again with thanks to the John Adams Institute, the Fulbright Commission, the Arbeiters Paris, please join me in welcoming Professor Jill Lepore. Uh, good evening. I'm um, so happy to be here in Amsterdam. Um, so happy to be speaking at an event sponsored by the Fulbright and the John Adams Institute. I uh, just have only been here once before, and I'm just, I can't really describe how filled with warmth I am about this city and this place. And now we're in this beautiful building on this beautiful evening, so what a joy it is for me to be here and also to have the occasion to talk with Kenneth and all of you this evening about a book that I really care about, that I wrote more than 20 years ago and has been nearly entire, 
entirely forgotten. So I'm also thrilled with joy <laughs> to have the chance to speak about it. So I'm going to ask a show of hands, who has heard of the Salem witchcraft trials? Okay, that's almost everyone. That's 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, I think it was 19 uh, people were accused and convicted of witchcraft uh, and hanged. None of them were burned at the stake. It's an infamous story in American history. It's known all over the world. It's kind of an iconic image of the, the sort of religious intolerance that, per, that pervaded the colonial experiment of uh, English settlers of New England. It's a metaphor through Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, for anti-communist crusading and religious zealotry and political zealotry of any type, right? It's a kind of proxy for zealotry. Um, the, what happened in New York in 1741 was much more dire uh, and is almost entirely forgotten. I think my book was really the first serious historical investigation into this episode in American history. So in the spring of 1741, a series of fires broke out in Manhattan. That is to say, Manhattan is much smaller uh, than in the 18th century than it is now. It was really uh, half a mile wide and a mile long from the tip of the battery, if you can picture New York, up to uh, Chamber Street. Everything beyond that is, is beyond the pale. The wall, which was Wall Street, which was uh, built by Africans enslaved by the Dutch, uh, was the wall, was the, that, that both south of Wall Street was Dutch New York uh, until 1664 when, uh, when New York became uh, English. And then those enslaved Africans took the wall down and used it to build City Hall, which is um, near where the Trinity Churchyard is now. So it's very small, almost village-like, maybe 10,000 people, of whom 2,000 were people uh, who, whose ancestors were from Africa. A lot of them have come from the Caribbean. Um, uh, so 20% of the population of New York City was enslaved in the 18th century. The highest percentage of enslaved people in the population in what was British North America above what became the Mason-Dixon line. It's a total outlier. There's just not nothing like this, these numbers of enslaved people anywhere else in, in what becomes the northern part of the United States. A series of fires broke out in this very Dutch, still half Dutch, half English, much African, especially a Khan city. Um, and there were rumors that they had been deliberately set. Fires are terrifying in a, in a tiny wooden city. Um, an investigation was conducted, and the rumor was that the fires were set part of a conspiracy, hence the conspiracy of my title, a conspiracy of the city's enslaved black men to burn the city down. Um, the, the conspiracy, as it was described almost exclusively by investigators and never by the people who were accused of the conspiracy, these black men were going to burn the city down, they were going to elect one of their number, a man named Caesar, to be the new governor of New York, and they were going to murder all the white men and marry the white women. That is the story, the plot, of the supposed New York slave conspiracy of 1741. As a consequence of the investigation, or during the investigation, nearly every black man in New York was arrested and thrown in a dungeon that was in the basement of City Hall and kept there for months where they were interrogated um, likely tortured, although that does not survive in the historical record. And the way the investigation went, if you refused to confess, you were burned at the stake. Thirteen black men were burned at the stake, and huge public spectacles where Dutch and English New Yorkers came out by the thousands to watch the public um, burning of these men over, 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 over a period of months. Um, Seventeen more were hanged. Four uh, white people were hanged, two men and a woman. Um, and then uh, another 80 or so uh, people who were accused of the conspiracy were shipped to the Caribbean, which was a fairly dire punishment. So the way the, 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 way the investigation worked, if you refused to confess, you were burned at the stake. If you confessed but refused to name names, you were hanged. And if you confessed and named names, you were shipped to the Caribbean. And if you confessed and named a lot of names, you got away without punishment. So you can, um, it is immediately obvious that the confessions are useless, right? Um, so I was really interested in this story because I had never heard it before I encountered it in graduate school. 
And I grew up on stories of the Salem witchcraft trial. And I'm fascinated by the erasure of meaningful historical events, right? So this, the, the scale of this episode is, is extraordinary. And it had vast repercussions for the colony of New York, um, be, beyond the personal repercussions for everyone involved. Um, and I decided I wanted to investigate the story, but was really challenged by the problem of the historical record. So most of my work as a historian has been about the asymmetry of the archive. That is to say, we know a great deal about some people, James Madison, for instance, John Adams, for instance. John Adams kept this unbelievably detailed, fascinating diary, right? And we know very little about almost everybody else. Um, and when I was trained as a historian, this was something to say, that's too bad, but we have these methods of social history where we can know about the everybody else in the aggregate. We can do demographic reconstitution so we could understand through going through parish deeds and records and birth and death certificates, for instance, the infant mortality rate among Dutch in New York. There are things we can know about people in the aggregate um, if they haven't left diaries or we don't have portraits of them, we don't have this m mound of evidence. Um, but knowing about people in the aggregate is quite different than knowing people as people, as individuals. And um, when I, so when I was in graduate school, I was pretty much taught, well, it's just too bad. That we, we, would, we would speak about people about for whom there was not really detailed, subjective, personal accounts. Um, these people were referred to as the inarticulate. And this was the sort of term of art in historical writing. Well, it, it's unfortunate that we know so little about the inarticulate. That is people who left few written records behind. So my work has pretty much all been about calling bullshit on that claim. Um, because actually, that's just lazy, right? Like at the end of the day, you, you have to do more work to find out about people who didn't leave John Adams' level of diaries or James Madison numbers of letters. Um, but you can find those things out. And if we can't actually attempt to address the asymmetry of the historical record, we can't really fundamentally address the problem of inequality in our own day, right? We're just replicating it. If the past that we, that we understand and our only ability to understand the past is by telling only stories about John Adams and James Madison, we're really not gonna know anything about how to solve uh, income inequality, problems of, of, of the global south, just wealth, wealth of different nations. There's just so many ways we lack the analytical tools to approach the problems of our own day if we don't tackle the historical record with some creativity and, I think, energy. So I decided I wanted to write about this New York story where the problem was not an absence of records, but the contamination of records. So because so many men were arrested and imprisoned and interrogated again and again and again, and because those who refused to confess, well, those who confessed, we have their confessions, those who refused to confess were tried, and so we have the records of their trials. There's actually just this explosion of evidence in 1741 about the enslaved population of Dutch and English New York that just doesn't, before 1741 you don't have it, after 1741 you don't have it. The problem is, well, you can guess what the problem is. All those confessions are junk, right? Like, if you're gonna be burned at the stake and you confess, in any court of law, that is an inadmissible form of testimony. It's not inadmissible in the 18th century because of the laws of evidence that obtain in criminal courts uh, in the colonies, which we can, we can talk more about. So I became really interested in trying to think of uh, how, what, what was my moral obligation as a historian to these records. Previous historians had pretty much just junked them and said, yeah, we have, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of these confessions and trial records, but they're all coerced. Um, also, the confessions, none of them were written by the men who were confessing, um, and the men who were interrogating them wanted to get one very particular story from them, and they wanted to get names so that they could arrest more people um, because there was just this extraordinary uh, hysteria on the part of the, the English and Dutch population of, of New York at the time. This alleged plot had a reason, it had a cause, and the cause was that just a few years before, in 1735, one of the most famous trials in early American history had happened in New York, the trial of the German immigrant printer, John Peter Zanger, who was charged with sedition for printing a newspaper, a series of newspaper stories that made fun of the governor. And he was jailed for sedition and ultimately acquitted 
on the grounds that the governor was actually a jackass. <laughs> and what everything he printed about him was true. And it was an in incredibly important and landmark case in early American legal history in establishing the freedom of the press. And more meaningfully, establishing that it, people in a place like New York had a right to gather together in taverns at night, decide the governor was terrible, come up with a plan to depose the existing governor and elect a different governor. The Zanger trial was about the formation of really the first opposition political party in early American history. American colonists came to see that you could tolerate political opposition, that it was possible for a party to be a loyal opposition. That's the foundation of the two-party system that emerges in the early United States, and it starts in New York in this era, and it's fraught. Everyone thinks that it's about to lead to civil war. So the way I ended up making an argument about among the many consequences of the alleged plot of black people in New York to burn the city down was that it was a way that the, a, a political pluralism was made possible but within very narrow bounds. The sort of construction of this fictive, shadow, rebellious, truly terrifying to the colonists group of men who shared a political interest, and that interest was their freedom, their own emancipation. And the argument of the book is that this structure, where there's a two-party political system that tolerates political dissent, is dependent itself, evolves. This really important political innovation in early American history that we associate with the emergence of a fully democratic polity is itself dependent on the construction of a fictive black danger.